we are going to, um, as I said, come back to our sermon series in, uh, in the book of Colossians, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4 today, verses 2 through 6. Um, and we, we took a couple week break from this to uh, focus on Easter, so we, had a, um, we, we focused on Palm Sunday and then Good Friday and, and uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter last Sunday. And uh, we're going to come back and we're going to finish um, over the course of the next two weeks uh, the book of Colossians. And, and just kind of a quick recap of what we've been talking about. Paul wrote to the church in Colossae to encourage them to stay connected in, uh, or centered in Christ. And this includes letting him transform our thinking and actions based off the new identity that we have in Jesus. When our life is centered in Christ, our thinking changes, our actions change because our identity has changed. Who we are is literally different than who we were before. And it's important to remember that that is the distinction that Paul makes. That is the New Testament, that is biblical, to say we, our actions and our thinking change because of our new relationship with God through Jesus, our new identity through Jesus, not the other way around. Well, if, if we could just get people to act the right way and maybe think the way we think, then they'll be okay. No, they won't. They need that relationship with Christ that transforms them, and then that changes their actions and their thinking. And I'd say, actually, in order, their thinking and then our, their actions, because we act out of how we think and feel about things. That's where our actions come from. And so when our, our identity, that is how we think about ourselves, change, that changes how we act towards others. Which brings us to um, Colossians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 2. And just to recap, going, leading right up to this point in time, um, right up through verse 1, Paul was talking about how the, our, our thinking, our identities change, our thinking change, our actions change, and then he says, here's some practical places that should happen. It should happen in your home, in the context of your marriage and your family. That should happen in your, in your employment situation at work. And right through verse 1 of chapter 4, that's what he's talking about. And then he starts kind of wrapping the letter up by giving kind of the last general instruction. And this is what, um, and we're going to get into that, we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive into verses 2 through 6 today. Heavenly Father, we, we need you to speak. Center our hearts, center our minds, center us fully on you. There's so much going on in our world and in our lives and in our families and our relationships and in everything else that is easy to get distracted. And those things that are going on, Lord, they're not meant to be distractions from you. They're meant to drive us to you so that we can be transformed by you, empowered by your spirit, and sent out as your hands and feet to represent you in those situations. Lord, show us what that looks like today. Show us what it looks like to have transformed prayer lives and thinking about the people around us. Show us what it looks like to, to have our, our thoughts and our speech and our actions be a witness for you, to those around us. Lord, you say the world will know you by how they see us act. Work in us and help us to join you in what you want to do. Give us ears to hear. Transform our hearts, our minds, our lips, our hands, and our feet for you. Show us this today in Jesus' name. So starting in verse 2, Paul says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in, in it with thanksgiving. 
At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how, uh, which is how I ought to speak. So Paul starts this out by encouraging the church to be devoted to prayer. The words that he uses here, it's literally devote yourself to prayer. This is not simply a call to pray on occasion or when we have serious need, which I think is how we often treat prayer. Like, oh, man, I'm really... You know, um, it's, it's, it's dinner time, let's pray. It's bedtime, let's pray. Oh, something serious, major is going on. We better start praying. Yes, all of those things are good things. But that is not what Paul says when he says devote yourself to prayer. He's saying make prayer your lifestyle. It's a call to have a lifestyle that is centered in an open communication with God. The heart of prayer, scriptural, biblically-based prayer, is not coming to God saying, do all this stuff for me. I know that is often how we treat prayer. You know, we, we'll, we'll have a prayer time later, and we're going to have prayer requests, right? And those prayer requests are centered on, here's things that we would like you to do on our behalf, God. That's not a bad thing, but that is not the same thing as having a devotion and a lifestyle of prayer. Biblical prayer is about open communication with the God of the universe. It is about listening far more than we speak. I will guarantee you that God has much more to say to you that is of value than you have to say to him that he doesn't already know. I remember when I was, when I was a young Christian... I really struggle with the concept of prayer. You know, I, I was taught, even in a non-Christian home, you know, oh, you know, say your prayers kind of thing, mentality, and, and I, I've shared this before. I used to think that you closed your eyes and you folded your hands, and I used to always put my hands above my head like this because I thought that this was an antenna and this was better reception so God could hear my prayer better. And it was about, you know, you say these words and you do these things and, you know, and, and maybe, maybe there's a God who's listening, maybe there's not. But then as I, as I came to know Christ and I, and I, I was taught and, and I was reading in Scripture all the things that Scripture says about prayer and, and about who God is, I was so confused because I'm like, why am I talking to God about things that the Bible says he already knows? I've been married for uh, 13 years. We just had our anniversary a couple weeks ago. And um, my wife and I are at a place in our relationship, which I'm sure, you know, if you've been married for any length of time, you get to this place in your relationship where you're like, oh, did I ever tell you about the time? And she's like, yes, you told me about that time. And she's like, but did I tell you? And I'm like, you did, yeah. We know each other's stories, right? And at the end of the day, you know, if I'm, if I'm working from home and I haven't left the house all day, there's very little that we could say like, oh, I, I, you know, hey, this happened to me. He's, she's like, I know, I was there. You know, like, because that's the way we view communication, right? I'm going to tell you something you don't know. But first of all, that's not actually what the heart of communication is about. The heart of communication is not simply about conveying information to another person. Sometimes communication is about just wanting to be heard, having the other person hear your concerns. Sometimes it's about speaking not just information, but real transformational truth into somebody's life. Telling, telling my kids, I know that you know, what you did was wrong. I love you anyway, and that's not going to change just because you screwed up. They might know that information, but in that moment, they need, to, they need to hear that information. It's not just information to them. It's truth. That is the heart of prayer. 
It is about coming before God and saying, I'm here. You know what's on my heart. What do you have to say about that? We are not often taught how to listen when we pray. We are often taught how to focus on, in fact, I've heard people say this, they're like, I can't pray in front of other people. I, I don't know how to talk like that. That is sad. Talk like what? But we do. We have a language when we pray, don't we? We start praying, Heavenly Father, we beseech thee in your holy name. Like, we don't talk like that most of the time. Years ago, I was part of a, a uh, young adults ministry in a, a church in Roseville, and um, one of my friends from there, Adam, he, we had a, a group of about 40-some people that were all part of this young adults class. And um, we all, you know, different, we had different leaders, and, and Adam taught on occasion, but he always led prayer. And the reason he led prayer was because of how he prayed. You might know people like this. When he prayed, you felt like you were sitting in on an intimate conversation with God, and you were invited to be there. It was natural. It was fluent. It was full of what I would call uncomfortable, necessary pauses. It was transformational. It was about not just coming before God to say what we want to say. It was more about coming before God and laying bare what was on our heart and being still and quiet enough to listen to what he has to say. Paul, when he says, devote yourself to prayer here, you're gonna see, we're going to see right now, he talks about what that prayer looks like. He says it's an alertness. He calls it an alertness. It's an awareness of one's surroundings, a consciousness of the needs of those around you, and a quiet heart to listen to God. I, again, when I was a kid, I, I was always taught when you, fold, when you pray, you close your eyes and you fold your hands. And I remember being in college and having a professor pray for us as a class one day. And I was, you know, half paying attention and I didn't close my eyes. And I noticed neither did he. And I thought, thought it was really strange. And so I asked him about it after class. I said, okay, I'm kind of tipping my hand here, but while you were praying, I noticed you didn't close your eyes. He's like, yeah. And he thought it was weird that I was even asking that question. And I said, instead you were looking at us. He goes, of course I was. I was praying for you. Why wouldn't I look at you? And it wasn't until later that I, like, he, we had this, like, he actually became my, actually, he wanted to be the, being the guy who became my advisor, so it worked out very well. But as we're talking about it, I'm like, why do we, why do we teach kids to fold their hands and close their eyes when they pray? And he's like, have you ever been around kids? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, it's so they're not fidgeting. It's so they're focused. So they're not looking at 50 different things. And he goes, sometimes as a, an adult, I need that too. But sometimes I need to have my eyes open when I pray. With my kids, I have to constantly say, close your eyes and fold your hands. Why? Because otherwise they're like, especially it's like bedtime and one of them is like, okay, I'm going to read this book before I go to bed. I'm like, put the book down. Because you're like three pages in while we're trying to pray. I need you to focus. And so that's, it's a good exercise for them. But boy, it's really hard to pray while you're driving if you have to fold your hands and close your eyes. Actually, Paul calls us actually to the type of prayer that is alert of our surroundings, that is aware of the needs of those around us and an awareness of the presence of God in the moment. Richard Mellick says it this way. He says, informed prayer is likely to be more purposeful, personal, and powerful. And what he means by that is not more powerful in that, like, okay, you'll really get God's attention and he'll really have to do what you want him to do. It's not what it's about. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis stories, this is a story, and what I mean by that is it's a story about C.S. Lewis. 
C.S. Lewis got married pretty late in life, and he married a woman named Joy. And shortly after they got married, Joy developed cancer. And she was hospitalized and eventually died. They were only married for a few years, and he, he wrote later, those were the best years of his life. Ironically, just a few years before he met his soon-to-be wife, he wrote an autobiography of his early life called Surprised by Joy. I always thought that was ironic. He's like, he wrote that before he met her, and then God was like, ha-ha, you don't even know. But there's a, there's a conversation that um, is reported that he had. He was meeting with some of his friends, and they were, uh, they were having lunch in a pub, and there were other professors, some of which were Christian, um, and some were not. One of the guys was actually a Presbyterian minister. And they were apparently sitting around a table one day having lunch while Joy was in the hospital. And two of his friends that were there were atheists. His professor friends were atheists. And his Presbyterian minister friend came in and said, we, I heard that Joy is on the mend. She's feeling better. Our prayers are working. And C.S. Lewis, who his friends called Jack, just stopped in his tracks and he said, do you think that's why I pray? Do you think that by praying I'm going to change God's mind? I don't pray because it changes God. I pray because when I pray, God changes me. And his, one of his atheist friends says, that is the first thing about prayer I've ever heard that makes any sense. And it's true. Think about the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he goes to the cross. His prayer is, not my will, but yours be done. That is the heart of all good prayer. It's coming before God and saying, you know what's on my heart. Now do what you want to do. When we say, let's pray in Jesus' name, we're commanded to pray in Jesus' name. That doesn't mean we say the, the prayer or the, 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 at the end of our prayer, we say the phrase, in Jesus' name, we put our, that's our holy stamp on it, and now that letter will get to God. To pray in Jesus' name means to ask for the kinds of things that Jesus would ask for. To pray like this means that we come before God alert and say, okay, Lord, show me what the things you want to be on my heart are and show me how you want me to respond to those things in your power and in your name. That's that kind of prayer. It's also defined by thanks, it, thankfulness. And I, thought, I always think of a, try to think of a different way to say an attitude of gratitude, but they rhyme and it just it kind of sticks in your head. Paul says that our prayer should be alert and thankful. They should be full of thanks, gracious, or um, gratitude, just full of gratitude towards God for what he has done, but also, and this is hard, but also even in the midst of struggle to say, I'm grateful for what's going on right now. Because... I know you're going to work. And I'm going to remind you of where Paul wrote the book of Colossians. Paul wrote this while he was imprisoned. And he said, may your prayers be marked by gratitude. How grateful do you think you would be sitting in jail? Writing to people you may never see. Sending it with somebody who is a good friend who you may never see again. And yet Paul says, our prayers should be marked with gratitude. It's, it's having this attitude that God is at work and there's always hope, being thankful for what he's done in the past and using that as an indicator of how he, of not necessarily, and just don't get me wrong on this, seeing how God has worked in the past is an indicator that he will work in the future. Not to say that he'll work in the same way. It's actually very dangerous to assume that of God. To assume that, well, you know, I prayed before and this is what God did. You know, I'm in the same situation. I'm sure God's going to do the same thing this time. Nope. He 
You might do something extremely different. If you want a good example of that, look at the story of Moses. God told Moses at one point in time when the people were in the wilderness and they didn't have water to drink. First time they're at a place called Mara, and he says, take, take the staff in your hand, go up to that rock, speak to the rock, and strike it, and fresh water will pour out. This happened after Moses prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, what do I do to, you know, like, how are, we gonna, how are you going to provide for your people? And that was God's answer. Fast forward a couple decades, and they're in a similar situation, and, uh, and, and Moses is like, I guess we need water, okay. And God's like, hey, here's what I want you to do. Go over and speak to that rock, and water will come out. And Moses is like, yeah, I got it, God, I got it. He goes over, and he takes a staff, and he hits it and speaks. And God said, I never told you to hit the rock. I never told you to hit the rock. You didn't listen. You know, because of that, Moses didn't get to enter the promised land. Did you know that? That was why Moses had to stay on the other side of the Jordan River. And you're like, wow, God's harsh. No. Nope. God is gracious. He needed to have a people to lead Israel that would listen intently when he spoke. That actually was alert in when they, when they spoke to God, they actually listened carefully to what he said. And Moses didn't in that matter. That wasn't just a one-time thing. That was a heart issue, and God was like, you know what, Moses? I, I'm going to have somebody else lead him into the promised land, somebody who's going to listen more intently. Paul then encourages the church to fo be focused on praying specifically for his ministry. We're kind of getting to the end of the letter. This isn't surprising. You know, if I, if I were to, like, we have missionaries write to us all the time, and, you know, they'll be like, here's an update of what's going on, and, you know, on occasion they might be like, here's a word of encouragement, and at the end of it they're like, here's some things you can pray for, right? It's pretty common. That's what Paul does here. We're going to get into kind of a list of things a little bit later, but here he explicitly says, pray for my ministry that I might be effective in sharing the gospel. Where's Paul at when he writes this? Prison. He says, pray for me that I might have an effectiveness in sharing the gospel. He goes, pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Don't be confused by the expression, open a door. He doesn't mean a jail door. He doesn't, he's not saying, pray that God will get me out of jail so that I can proclaim the gospel. He's not saying that. He's saying, give me, that God may give me opportunity to proclaim Christ even while I'm in chains. In other words, God, Paul is not saying, pray that God change my situation. He's saying, pray that God uses my situation to advance the gospel. Because that is always his heart and his mission. Am I sharing Jesus with other people? And he, he goes explicitly to talk about opportunities, timing, and wording. I'm going to just read that in, again. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. He said, an open door, that's opportunity, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. In other words, that I have the right words to say to the right people at the right time. So he invites the church at Colossae to join him in ministry by praying for him, for opportunity, timing, and the words to speak. By the way, if your idea of sharing the gospel is, I go through the four spiritual laws and I read this pamphlet, that's not opportunity, that's not timing, that's not the words to speak. Don't get me wrong, you know, four spiritual laws are great, but like you gotta, you gotta know when to, that's the right approach and when it's not. 
There is no set way to share the gospel with people. If there was, we'd have it in scripture. Sometimes the way to that open door might be somebody says something that, you know, where they're talking about something going weird in their life and you're just like, this is an opportunity to talk about hope. But that's letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide that, which is why he says, be alert in your prayer. In fact, that's where he's kind of going from here. The first four verses, the focus is on pray for alertness, pray for us. The second two verses, he says, and ask God for wisdom. And it's specific what that wisdom is about. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Do you see what Paul just did there? He said, I want you to pray for my ministry that it might be effective, that I might have the words to speak and the opportunity to share the gospel with people as God leads me to. And by the way, you should do the same. You should have that same mentality. The job of sharing the gospel, reaching people that don't know Christ, was not the job of just Paul. It's the job of the church, everyone, always at all times. That is our mission, first and foremost, above everything else. Are we preparing people to meet Jesus? by introducing them to him right now. First, he encourages us to walk in wisdom. This is an action-oriented command here. He's saying, to, anytime you, you hear the word walk in the New Testament used in this kind of way, it's saying live, like do something, like how you live ought to be wise. And he says this towards, and this is a very interesting way that Paul uses this expression. He says towards outsiders. Outsiders means those who do not yet know Christ. But what is the purpose of that communication? That they remain outsiders? No, but that they're invited in. The point is, Paul is saying, be wise in how you walk, how you live in front of people that don't know, yet know Jesus. And I want to I really emphasize that. Those who do not yet know Jesus. Because God uses our lives as a witness to them, either for Christ or against him. And Paul says, be wise in how you act towards those who don't know Christ. And before you're like, right, don't interact with them. You gotta gotta guard your no, actually, quite the opposite. He's saying, be in their midst, live among them, interact with them, and do it in a wise way. Don't get sucked into their sin into other people's sinfulness. We got enough of that of our own to deal with but be wise in how we do it with the purpose of trying to win people over. He says, making the most of every top opportunity to win them for Christ. Actually, it's interesting. In Greek, it says, um, the, the ESV translates this, making the most of the time, which is actually a really good translation. The actual wording in Greek is redeeming the time. And the reason that some translators don't use the term redeeming there is because we, that's a really loaded term. Redeeming, what does that mean? It literally means using the time for something that is of value. That's how it's used in this context, to use it of something of value. So um, on Monday, I had to do one of those fun tasks that you have to do on occasion. I had to go to the DMV. 
And uh, the only DMV open in a 30-mile radius from where I live is the one that happens to be in Elk River. All, one's in Ramsey, some of them in, in St. Cloud, some of the other ones are all closed. So it was a beautiful day on Monday, thankfully. Um, and there was a line of 20 people standing outside the DMV. And the DMV in Elk River is small. Um, and there was like another like four to six people in the building, not to mention people that work there. And I stood in line and I was like, oh my goodness, I do not, this is not how I want to spend my day. And there's all these other people standing there and everybody's kind of complaining about how the lines are long. You know, DMV, and I made a joke about the, the, the Disney movie Zootopia. You guys ever see Zootopia? If you ever see Zootopia, they go to the DMV to do a license background check and um, sloths are who run the DMV. And they do everything extremely slowly. And we're, I made that joke, and somebody's like, oh, you must have kids. And it was this open door for this amazing conversation I got to have with the two people standing right in front of me and the guy right behind me, where we got to kind of get to know each other a little bit and, you know, eventually get to, what do you do for a living? I'm, I'm a pastor. I got to share the gospel with three people standing in line that day. One of those guys, by the way, the guy behind me, who was a Nigerian immigrant, he was like, he's like, you're a pastor? He's like, oh. And we started talking. He was a brother in Christ. It was amazing. And the two people in front of me, I got to share the gospel with, and they got to share with me how the church had hurt them so badly they wanted nothing to do with it. And I got to t tell them about how I was so sorry that... So that sometimes we don't represent Jesus well. That even though the church, that people in the church might have hurt you, I hope that you don't take this as indication that God has turned his back on you. It was a really cool experience. That was making the most of an hour and a half in line at the DMV. By the way, I didn't go there with, I'm going to witness to three people today. That was not my intent. My intent is I need to get new tabs for my one vehicle and new plates for the other one and a title transfer. This is going to take forever. And this is my fourth time dealing with this in the last like, year. And, uh, and I literally got out of the car and I was like, Lord, I do not want to be here. Please give me a good attitude. And God instead gave me a great opportunity. By the way, I, didn't plan, I, I couldn't have planned any of that out. I was just having an openness and a willingness to have to just be used in that moment. And, and I'm sure I said stupid things and, you know, whatever, but it's okay. It's, it's redeeming the time. That could have been wasted time. I'm like, well, yeah, but you did the things you were there to do. Right, but was it, was it eternal in its nature? Larry Herman and I have had this conversation before that he's like, I get a lot of, he calls it windshield time because he commutes down to to Bethel for, for work. And I'm like, what a great opportunity to just pray. Or he's like, I make, you know, I make phone calls and he, that's often we connect throughout the week and I'm, I'm like, oh, he must be, he call, he's calling me, he's either driving to work or he's driving home from work. Make the use of the time. Do something that is productive and life-giving and allows you to connect with, with God and others. That's what Paul's talking about here. This is a call to let our actions preach the gospel. That's what this is about. Francis of Assisi uh, famously said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Think about that. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. By the way, he's not saying don't actually say words, but he's saying... Our, our life preaches the gospel powerfully. And sometimes it's not about the words that we say, it's about how we're treating the people around us and things like that. If you go to a restaurant and you treat the wait staff horribly and then you go to leave and you're like, I'm going to leave a little Jesus track. I'm like, yeah, you're doing a great service to God right now. Not to mention, if you leave a Jesus track and not a tip. Oh, my goodness. I have, a friend, <clears throat> I have a friend that I used to work with at Target that told me one time, they were working as a waitress, and um, 
a horrible shift. It was on an Easter Sunday. She was working at like a Perkins, and, um, and people came in to have lunch there on their way to go see family or whatever. And they'd obviously just come from church and they were, they were kind of short with her and kind of rude and it was extremely busy. And they left one of those tracks that looks like a $20 bill and no actual tip. And she was like, I hate stupid Christians. That's what she said to me. She's like, I just, oh my goodness. She's like, I kind of wanted to, she goes, I knew I'd lose my job, but I kind of wanted to slap them when I found that out. They're walking out the door. I really want to go say something. That's not, that's not actually winning people for Christ. I mean, if you want to leave a, 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 a track that looks like a $20 bill, wrap it in two other 20s. Then maybe they'll be like, oh, look at that. How we live preaches the gospel to people. But then Paul continues by saying, we should also talk with wisdom. This is a call for our speech to be winsome, to win people for Christ. So when when Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel in all that you do, when necessary, use words, he wasn't saying, this is an excuse not to ever say anything. No, actually, Peter says the same thing. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. Always be be ready to give an answer, actually, kind of implies that we're living in such a way that people say, you live differently, and and maybe they're the one that even will strike up the conversation. And so be ready to, to answer them. But the whole point of this is we need to let God lead us in, in these conversations. This is a call for our speech to be, first of all, grace-filled, kind and loving. I'm just going to read that text again to us here. He says, walk with wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious. And I, and I chose to put up there grace-filled because I, I think sometimes we forget that's what gracious means. It means full of grace. Grace meaning that we treat people better than they, sh- they deserve to be treated. That's what it means. When God shows us grace, it's him treating us better than we deserve to be treated. So maybe your, uh, maybe your spouse or one of your kids or your neighbor or somebody at work or somebody at the grocery store or somebody in traffic does something that offends you. How do you talk to them in return? Do you treat them the way their actions deserve or do you say, no, I'm going to be gracious? I'm going to be kind to them and loving even though their actions don't deserve kindness or love. And then he he uses this great expression. He says, let it be seasoned with salt. Let your your words be seasoned with salt. And and so we're clear here. He doesn't mean, therefore, use salty language. We have that expression to mean something very different today. Do you know where that expression, salty language, comes from? Sailors. You're right. It's like, oh, you talk like a sailor, meaning you swear a lot. One of my mentors was a, a, a Navy chaplain for quite a long time. And uh, we used to joke that he said, sometimes I feel more like a, a, a sailor than a, than a pastor. And I, I would joke, well, your language certainly <laughs> reflects that at times. Because he'd catch himself, he'd say something, I'm like, dude, like, mixed company, like, maybe don't talk like that. That's not what Paul, I mean, we're not supposed to talk like that. But when he says season with salt, he actually means the same thing that Jesus means when Jesus talks about us being the salt of the earth. Salt in the ancient world, along with today, had had, um, a couple of major uses. Salt was used to both preserve food and add to its flavor. So like, you know, if you're going to go camping and you're not going to have means to keep meat fresh, you ever play the game Oregon Trail, what do you bring with you? Yeah, salted meat, right? Jerky. You bring something that's going to preserve it. Okay? That's the idea. It it preserves. It actually helps. 
salt has this really cool, um, if you don't know this, this is like the chemist in me, salt is actually an ionic compound, and when it, it, it interacts with things, it breaks down into both a base and an acid. And the base keeps the acid from going crazy and just breaking something down to nothing, because the acid that it actually produces is hydrochloric acid. If you didn't know that, Okay, so table salt is sodium chloride, and when you add it to water, it becomes sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. That's what it becomes. By the way, either of those things together are actually deadly. If I, poured, if I took a steak and I poured hydrochloric acid on it, I can't eat that steak, and that steak won't exist in a few minutes. It'll get just dissolved to nothing. If I use sodium by the way, sodium hydroxide is lye. You know, that we used to make soap from, that some weird Norwegian people used to put on certain fish? Ugh, ugh, sorry. Just had a lutefisk back, back flash, uh, flashback. That was horrible. But even lutefisk, you have to put something in with it, otherwise you can't eat it. You have to, you have to process it in such a way. But when you put salt in food, one of the things it does is it helps preserve it. It actually, the sodium part helps it from getting broken down and rotting too much. And the chlorine actually dissolves away um, bacteria and other things on it. It's a preserving agent. But it also does something else really amazing. You ever eat something and you're like, this does not taste that great. And then you put a little salt on it, you're like, there it is. There it is. You know that salt on its, on its own doesn't have a lot of flavor. Like, if you ever, like, take some salt, you're like, I guess it kind of has a flavor. But when you add salt to something else, it takes whatever flavor is there, and it bumps it up. It enhances it. I swear, every time my wife and I are cooking, and one of us is cooking and calls the other one in the kitchen to taste something, I almost always say, it needs more salt. And sure enough, she's like, I think there's enough salt in there. And we add a little salt, and she's like, okay, everything tastes a little better. That's what salt does. Now, obviously, we talk about like too much salt isn't good for you. That's right. But what Paul is getting at here is that our language should be seasoned with salt. It's not all salt. It's seasoned with it. And what he's talking about here is that our conversations should do the same thing as what salt does. They should preserve. That is, they should point people to Jesus who can save them. That's what preserved means, right? To save you. Our conversations, how we speak to people, it doesn't always have to be like, here's the three steps that you need to follow. No. But sometimes it's just saying, you know, letting the Lord lead you. And it might be just saying to somebody, I'm sorry you're going through that. I, I, I'm sorry that you're going through that. You know, God tells us that he cares about our problems. And can I just pray for you about that? And if they're like, okay, like maybe praying with them right then or, or letting the Holy Spirit lead and just say, hey, you know, if you're not comfortable with that, I, I'll, I'll pray for you some other time. Sometimes it's just giving them a word of encouragement. It's whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to do. But it's pointing them to Jesus. And then the other part of that is it's supposed to add flavor. It's supposed to bless and encourage other people. That's how we should be known. We should, our language should be seasoned with that kind of salt. I, I heard somebody say it this one way one time, and I'm like, that's not a bad way to say it. They said, notice it says seasoned with salt, not a block of salt. A block of salt tastes disgusting, unless you're a deer, right? You don't eat a block of salt. You season it with salt. I hate saying this, but no, and by the way, all of this, what is this all pointing to? This is all has to do with how we interact with people who don't know Jesus. That's what this is about. All of this is about how do we interact with people who don't know Jesus. I, all of us probably know non-Christians who can't stand being around people who are too quote-unquote religious. And what I mean by that is all they ever do is talk about like Jesus or, or church stuff, all the time, constantly. That's all they can seem to have conversations about. That, 
that kind of, for some people, that's a big turnoff. That's not seasoned with salt. That's a block of salt to them. It's about letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide conversations. Inviting him into our conversation in such a way that when he says, say something, we say it. And, and, and literally, God is in that conversation then. Like I said, Jesus says this too, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I remember first reading that text and being like, isn't that what we do with salt? I live in Minnesota. In the winter, we throw salt on the ground. That's what we do with it. They never did that in the ancient world unless the salt was horrible. And even then, they're like, this is for, it's, they used it as a weed killer. They would use salt that had sat out and gone stale and kind of lost its potency. They'd use it to kill weeds. They'd put it on roads, like we put it on roads, not for traction, so that weeds wouldn't grow up through the little blocks. They were like, he was like, it's useless, it's garbage now, so I guess we could try to find some use for it. Jesus is saying, be salty in that good way. Both of these things, both this call to prayer and call to wisdom, are calls to use wisdom in meeting people where they are at when we speak to them. This is what Jesus does with us. He meets us where we're at. And all of these are invitations to join Paul in his work of pointing others to Jesus. You notice how he said this? He goes, be alert in your prayer, pray for my ministry, and be doing ministry yourself. Think about Paul, Paul's perspective. Paul's like, man, I'm in jail. Lord, give me an open door to be able to preach the gospel. How about the letter you're writing right now? You're going to encourage others to be preachers of the gospel. That is the role of every Christian. If we know Jesus, it's our job to share him with other people. So here's our so what. Are we devoted to prayer? Are we devoted to it? Is it our lifestyle? And are we devoted to sharing Christ with others in both word and deed? That is very clearly what Paul is calling us to do here, what God is calling us to do through, through the Apostle Paul. We are called to be witnesses for Jesus in everything we do. Here's our meditation verse. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. 